Oh, he's the shove it man. Oh, he's the shove it man. He's gonna shove it. Yeah. He's, he's gonna, gonna shove it man. Since doing this YouTube thing, my very first original series was covering the TNA WWE <coughs> Monday Night War. And that is my most viewed video with millions of views. There's obviously an interest in that subject. I've always wanted to return to that video in some way, maybe a remastered version with interviews. But something I can do right now is find out what happened after the <coughs> war <coughs> ended. TNA was at its wackiest during that war with a bunch of has-beens all over the screen, and they were beaten in the war convincingly. It is worth noting that although TNA never beat the WWE in the ratings war, WWE did take some measures against TNA. And you can deny it all you want, but I've watched the whole thing, and WWE increased their effort by at least 10% for this short war. You don't just randomly bring in Bret Hart on the same night as Hogan's appearing in TNA as a coincidence. But for today's video, we know that they've won the war, so will they stop putting in the effort? And will TNA potentially be a better show without the added pressure of trying to beat Raw in the ratings? Not sure if this is going to be a new series, let me know down below. And if I see just one comment about wrestling bios, a brick will be coming through your window tonight. Now let's fight. We start off with Raw and it's Randy Orton. The fans have apparently turned up tonight to catch a glimpse of Randy Orton. He's taken on Edge at the next pay-per-view. He starts talking about Edge, but uh, he's quickly interrupted by Meatloaf. This is unfortunately the guest host era of Raw. And Meatloaf isn't even the main guest host. I guess they've doubled down on this night, lucky us. He actually cuts a funny promo, screaming Randy Orton over and over again. He also proposes that Orton use Meatloaf's music for his entrance music, and then Orton RKO's him. Actually very funny, and at least they kept it brief. Edge is out now, he points out that Orton obviously doesn't like celebrities. Edge agrees with his hatred of them. Edge has been complaining to WWE headquarters about the guest host. Wow, at least they're self-aware. WWE have agreed to change the rules and guest hosts will not have the power to book matches anymore. There's going to be a new permanent Raw general manager. Oh no, let me guess who. Yep, it's Vicky Guerrero. What a channel changer. She doesn't agree with Orton attacking celebrities and he should be punished for it. The punishment will be a handicap match against Edge and a partner of his choosing. Our first match will be Chris Jericho who's going for his gone off bowl of custard look and he takes on DH Smith with Natalia Neidfart. If Jericho wins, he and The Miz will receive a tag title shot at the pay-per-view. We start with smack talking followed by slap talking. Hart Smith with a very early delayed suplex. He misses his leg drop and catches a kick to the face from Y2J. After a submission for a bit, Hart Smith wakes up and throws Jericho over belly to belly. Jericho's in real trouble as he gets a snap slam, but it's just a two. Jericho closes him down for back elbow. He tries the lion salt which misses and Hart puts him in the sharpshooter. He's not in it for long before making the ropes. A thumb to the eye makes Hart cry and the Jericho Codebreaker ends the match in 3 minutes. Always found this finisher to look incredibly weak, it is what it is. Edge is seen in the back talking to the boy in the beanie Batista, he's looking for his partner tonight. Now it's time to meet your guest host for the night, it's Ron the Truth Killings bringing out Flavor Flav. Truth does his normal rap with Flavor Flav interrupting every so often just yelling, yeah boy. A truly spectacular performance. Truth introduces him as a rap legend whilst the crowd barely react. They do actually warm up to him after a bit though. He's just here to push some new TV show that he's in. Eventually all the hype leads to a match between the Truth and Regal. Truth quickly does the splits into the kicks. Then the Colognes rush the ring and the match is thrown out in 10 seconds. This match wasn't really worth the hype was it? Truth is killed with a backstabber. Flavor Flav is on commentary and he says oh my god they've broken the Truth's back. It is revealed that the Colognes were paid off by Ted DiBiase. The crowd are in complete silence as Ted slowly gorms at the ring. That is a great point to jump off to see what TNA are up to. Oh no, the first person we see is the leader of the Grey Crew, Eric Bischoff. TNA takes a quick moment to explain that the fans asked for TNA to move to Thursday nights. Yeah, right. Nothing to do with getting destroyed in the Monday Night War, of course. Bischoff actually keeps it short here and he introduces the TNA heavyweight champion, No Job Rob. He's going to be defending against Styles on pay-per-view. Bischoff tells Rob that we're trying to do a fan vote to see who else is getting a title shot at him. Bischoff tells us that Jeff Hardy is one of the top votes and he makes a match between Rob and Hardy for tonight. But there's a problem, no one can find Jeff Hardy. So instead RVD can have the night off. Rob doesn't want a night off because he's enjoying being a fighting champion. He says he's here to pop ratings. AJ Styles interrupts, he is of course the man RVD beat for that belt. AJ Styles lectures him about needing to be a role model. 
He's supposed to be a heel, but the crowd are frantically chanting for AJ. He calls Rob a Cheech and Chong sideshow. AJ wants a match tonight because it gives him a chance to break Rob's leg before the pay-per-view. Then Jeff Hardy turns up. He is here after all. He blames his lateness on TNA changing nights. He asks for his match against Rob. Styles flips out. It's decided they'll have a triple threat tonight. Pretty nice main event to be fair. In the back, Jeremy Borash interviews Madison Rain of the Beautiful People. She's having a match against Tara at the pay-per-view. The Beautiful People have all the knockouts gold. Lacey Von Erich is dancing on the spot. She runs away saying she needs to pee. A potential new gimmick for Lacey Von Botch it seems. Madison tells Velvet to just accept her weirdness because Lacey's really pretty. Our opening match is Taylor Wilde taking on Tara. Taylor double legs her and she's all over Tara. Taylor dives on her off the ring apron and quickly she gets back in the ring. Taylor hits the spinning heel kick which causes Tara to dump in her thong with fear. She is just playing possum though and she throws Taylor Wilde out the ring. She sends her back into the ring but misses her slingshot leg drop. Taylor also misses her dive as one kick connects. And that's the free for Tara. What a random short match that was. Tara is a bad winner and she attacks Taylor using a knee brace. Sarita runs her off. In the back, the camera is running along. Ring valet Chelsea is crying surrounded by geeks. Christy Hemi says that she's been attacked. Taz asks what the hell is going on. Back at the ring, Brian Kendrick is pacing around in circles. He takes on Douglas Williams. He cuts a promo first though. He says Kendrick is not just crazy, but he's a loser and he hasn't seen him win a single match. So this match shouldn't happen tonight. Williams was recently stripped of the X Division title due to the Iceland Volcano, but he still carries the belt with him because it was kind of unfair. In this match, Doug has an easy time, but he starts getting distracted because the real X Division champion Kaz has joined the commentary team. Nothing really happens. Taz tells Kaz that his belt is right over there. Why don't you go and get it, buddy? This inspires Kaz to go and get the belt. Williams sees him coming down the ramp and grabs the belt. The distraction is enough for Kendrick to roll up Williams. Another short, horrible match. Kaz versus Williams at the pay-per-view for the belt. No buys. In the back, Hebby is trying to find out who attacked Chelsea. She asks Simon Diamond, who refuses to reveal who it was, but he says he can't believe who it was. Why is this getting so much attention? A bit later, Hemi hypes up that she now knows who it was, and this is going to send shockwaves through the wrestling world. But the police won't allow her to reveal the name until the attacker has been arrested. Back in the ring, the Bucks are just shoved here without an entrance. They'll be in a two-on-one handicap match against Mike Morgan. The Bucks jump him as he comes to the ring, which doesn't help, and he double clotheslines them. He hits Jeremy Buck with the elevator, but doesn't pin. He smashes Max Buck with a carbon footprint. Again, no cover is made because he starts cutting a promo. He calls out Hawk Hogan. Morgan is doing this sole tag team champion gimmick, and he's angry because Hogan's making him team up with somebody at the pay-per-view, but he won't tell him who it is. He says let the bloodshed begin and he's about to boot a young buck into the ring pole when Samoan Joe stomps to the ring. Morgan misses his kick and then he gets a jumping kick from Joe. It's the muscle buster from Samoan Joe. His face vibrates and shakes as Nappy is well and truly dumped. I guess that ends that match. Wait, no, Morgan is still laying when the band's music starts playing. It's Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and Eric Young who looks like a blind man. Kevin Nash has the tag title shot in a case. Now I know TNA gets dumped on quite a lot but this was actually quite clever. Nash won that tag team title shot months ago and everybody forgot he'd even had it. And now Nash cashes it in at a time where Kevin Nash won't have to do any wrestling. It makes sense for his character. The band are the new tag team champions. Poor Mike Morgan. He was down from that one Samoan Joe muscle buster for about five minutes. In the darkness, two men with mohawks are talking about something, but the sound quality is terrible. That's a great time to jump back over to Raw. We come back to Raw of Maurice beating up a karate fighter in a training video. She can't manage one of the moves he's asking her to do and the karate instructor tells her she isn't doing good enough. I legit thought the instructor was a girl. Maurice bitch slaps him. I guess there's no point in learning the martial arts now. Randy Orson backstage promo. He doesn't care about the handicap match tonight and Vicky Guerrero won't be able to forget tonight when he's finished with her. Mark Henry is on the moon. How high were they when they made this? Raw will be advert free next week. What a treat. Zack Ryder is now dumped in the ring. He's chatting up Alicia Fox and Gail Kim. It's always weird seeing Gail Kim in WWE to me, especially on a video like this one. Ryder swears that tonight will be his first win on Raw. He takes on Evan Airborne. He makes the girls yawn. He hits a head scissors followed by a big kick and he's almost won already. Zack manages to connect with the Rough Rider but he hesitates for too long and he can't get the free. I don't remember Zack Ryder being ginger. Evan Bourne hits him with knees in the corner. Alicia wants to stop Evan from diving, and Gail Kim stops her and Bourne hits the airborne on Ryder for the free. 
Another two minute match. Evan looks lovingly at Gail. She seems disgusted by him, but then they link arms. Gail is wearing leggings, but this isn't TNA, so the camera doesn't give us a good shot. This is one place that TNA will always win, and that can't be denied. Wiener is out now, and all the little kids go nuts. I wonder what year of Cena's career is most disliked. He is here to decide what stipulation his match will have with Batista at the pay-per-view. He seemed pretty miserable. He rambles on for ages before deciding on an I quit match. The great white Sheamus interrupts him. Cena tells him to get in the ring and fight him. It's about to happen when Batista sneaks into the ring and spears Cena. Cena is dumped out the ring like a piece of trash and he's shoved into the ring pole a couple of times. Batista rolls Wiener back in the ring and Sheamus broke kicks him before Mark Henry returns from the moon to beat the bad guys up. I always hate it when Wiener doesn't get his comeuppance, so now I hate Mark Henry through Cena association. Vicky Guerrero is sexting someone backstage before Edge marches up to her. He says he's found his partner for tonight. Edge would like to clear the air about their past. They may not be married anymore, but they're going to be friends. Edge wants her to be at ringside. Great, so that match is going to be ruined then. Why the hell is it so important that Vicky Guerrero is at ringside? Come to think of it, why is she all over the show? Another match now, Tyson Kidd will take on The Miz. If The Kid beats The Miz, the Hearts will get a US title shot. Lots of creative storylines going on here tonight. The Miz seems focused, he smacks the kid out of the ring, but he takes too long gritting his teeth. Kid barges him into the gut and springboards into the ring for pin. And it's over in 30 seconds. Great match that was, it sucks Sonny Siaki's ass. All of these matches did. The Miz is a bad loser and he agrees that the Hearts will get a US title shot, but he says it's his choice which Hart family member he'll face. But he doesn't want to face any of the ones that are there, instead he wants to face Bret Hart next week. So if this series continues, we have that to look forward to. Josh Matthews is in the back being a dork trying to interview Batista. He says he's going to make Cena scream I quit. Back at the ring, there's more geeks. It's the NXT rookies. <sighs> then even more geeks come out and join them. They will be having some sort of wacky handicap match. I have never seen an 8 on 4 handicap match before. Justin Gable and Yoshitatsu try to wake up the crowd with their unique offense. Unfortunately, David Otonga forcefully tags in and I fall back asleep. He almost kills Yoshitatsu with a shoulder block. Heath Slater and Morrison are in now. Morrison beats up several NXT guys all by himself. He smashes Slater with the big knee, but he delays for too long with the Starship Pain and Slater gets his knees up. Daniel Bryan's in now, but the comrades team are too busy laughing at how much of a failure he is. Then he proves them wrong by rolling up Santina Morella in 10 seconds for his first WWE win. A horrible match, much like all the matches on this show. It feels like they're keeping the matches short because maybe something good is happening at the end of the show. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Switch it back to TNA. Six men are just dumped in the ring. It seems nobody gets an entrance on this episode of TNA. These are the main stars of their tag division, believe it or not. The Dudleys, the Machine Guns and Beer Money. And this will be a three-way tag match, so it sounds potentially good. But no, it's actually a four-way because the men with mohawks are also here. It's Jesse Neal and Jeff Hardy's stoner friend. Alex Shelley and James Storm start and they trade lots of switches. Saban makes the blind tag and takes Storm out the ring. They smash him with a suicide dive. Devon Dudley tags Saban and he'll go against Bobby Roode. Devon hits the snap slam and a double flapjack with his brother. Stoner Friend also makes a blind tag and he goes and hits Roode with a crossbody. His next move is countered and he's thrown out the ring. Storm beats up the Stoner Friend on the outside of the ring. Beer Money get him back in the ring and they do some double teaming which should lead to a free but Bubba breaks up the pin. Shannon almost rolls up Roode but it's just a small hope spot for him. Storm grabs the friend's mohawk which seems to fire him up and he does a wheelbarrow bulldog. Shannon makes the tag to his mohawk friend Jesse Neal. He's destroying everyone. He drops Rude on his face and almost wins the match. The match breaks down now. It's looking like the guns might win until Rude drops Saban on the ring apron. Jesse Neal ends up in the ring with both of the Dudleys who hit him with a doomsday device. Jeff Hardy's stoner friend makes the save. The Dudleys look to 3D the stoner friend, but Jesse Neal breaks it up. And Bubba stares at him like, why are you breaking up our move? Uh, because he's your opponent, dumbass. Moments later, the stoner friend has a morgasm and Jesse Neal has the spear. The men with the mohawks are beating the three greatest TNA tag teams of all time. A fun match which I wish went longer. A pre-taped segment with Ric Flair talking. He has subtitles because the audio quality is bad. He predicts that his man AJ Styles will win the triple threat tonight. He also thinks RVD will get injured and you better bank on it because Ric Flair said so. Thus, two TNA episodes in a row that Ric Flair's taken little shots at Austin for no reason. The Welsh roid Rob Terry is walking down a corridor, snorting and gritting his teeth. It's been a while since we've seen old Rob Terry, and let me tell you, I haven't missed him. 
Somewhere backstage, RVD and Jeff Hardy are joking about their match tonight. Once again, the audio quality is so bad that they've had to put in subtitles. How does something like this happen so regularly when you have a production team and all the equipment you need? Why would they even include this segment in the final product? They just kiss each other's asses anyway. The Welsh Reuter is out for his match. He's going to be defending his global title against the idiot Abyss. But he doesn't come out. A camera goes backstage where Abyss is being handcuffed. He's frantically screaming that he didn't do anything wrong. He sounds so pathetic. He keeps asking for Dixie Carter and Hogan to come and help him. He's on the verge of tears as he's marched away. Great monster you have here, TNA. Every time I see him, all I can think of is Lenny from Of Mice and Men. Desmond Wolf jumps him in the car park. The cops keep saying, monster, get in the car. Hogan's here now and Abyss is pleading his innocence to the Hulkster. Now Abyss is getting upset because the cops want him to take off his mask. Hogan slash George hides Abyss from the camera and removes his mask. Abyss is shaking or jumping around in the back of the police car. Why does Hogan do a limping run after the cop car? The Welsh Reuter is still waiting for his match in the ring. He looks miserable. Suddenly Orlando Jordan runs into the ring and attacks Terry. He yanks on his slash zone. He also hits Rob Terry with a pipe. He puts some playing cards on Rob Terry's back and then he's taken away. These two will be having a match on pay-per-view. Doesn't that make you want to buy TNA Sacrifice? Orlando is still in the ring, but he's got a mic now. He keeps calling himself the TNA Wildcard. He asks if the crowd want him to leave and they all scream with happiness. He issues an open challenge instead of leaving. This is answered by a chubby looking Tyson Tomko. He looks like if the master of the cab driver slam could grow a beard. He then appropriately hits a cab driver slam. That doesn't hurt Jordan who double legs him, but he lets Tomko back up. Tomko presses him overhead into the Scott Hall special, the sack of shit. No pin is made. He tries another slam instead, but he's shoved into the turnbuckle and drop kicked. Bad looking snapmare from Jordan. He does another one which looks better. Tomko eventually manages a clothesline for a two. Jordan fights him off with a backstabber. He tries another slam that he can't manage because Jordan locks on a guillotine and Tomko taps out, I guess. Simply the greatest. Well, that's almost right. In the back, Hogan is talking to someone. He says he knows Abyss is innocent. Lacey Von Botch has returned from the toilet and she hands Hogan a phone saying this is all a big mistake. The leader of the Grey Crew, Eric Bischoff, is lecturing Tara. He says her attitude is piss poor and she's going to be forced to wrestle another match tonight. And that match is next. The Hawks' favourite, Sarita, will take on Tara. They fight on the ramp because this is an intense match, apparently. They get in the ring, but Tara immediately bails from the ring. Sarita's completely dominating the match anyway. Sarita does a move that I've literally never seen before. She follows that of a slingshot splash. Unfortunately, she's distracted trying to remove the knee brace of Tara. She's completely snapped and she elbows the ref in the face. This is a ref bump. Tara smacks her with the knee brace in the face and the ref instantly wakes up to count the three. Tara is a bad winner, so she continues the attack after the bell. What of all these pointless two minute matches? In a cupboard backstage, AJ Styles is doing goofy grin. That for me is a good time to catch the last part of Raw. Over on Raw, it's a very long recap about how Drew McDonald is feuding with Matt Hardy. I smell money in this feud. Drew's been suspended or something, nobody cares. The Bellas talk to Flavor Flav about his TV show again. Is it not enough to pay these celebrities? Why do they have to shield their goods too? Santina and Kozlov walk up asking if they could be a tag team. William Regal also walks up. What is there, a revolving door in this office? Regal says Flavor Flav is talentless. Flav bets Regal that he can't rap. Straight out of Blackpool, William Regal. My rhyme's so intense it should be illegal. My style is refined, not crude and crass. I'll keep you grounded like volcanic ash. I'll take you down rung by rung. I'm just like British Parliament. I'm totally hung. Well, that sucked. Flavor agrees that it sucked. Yeah, boy. Regal looks like he's going to a funeral. Batista is here, but first we get another promo with the man from the moon, Mark Henry. Batista is sitting in his chair looking bored. I know how he feels. Mark Henry once again teleports down from the moon and he'll face Batista in this match. Batista kicks him in the head as he comes through the ropes. Batista <laughs> hits him with a chair time and time again. Wow, yet another incredible match. How the fuck is this episode of Raw rated just shy of 8 out of 10? People have seriously low standards. This is worse than that episode of Raw I had to watch recently on the How Bad Can It Be belt. Smack yourself one until it's felt. At least that show had one good match. This show is nothing. I'm not even sure where this time's gone. With 10 minutes left of the show, we start the main event. Randy Orton in a handicap match. He of course faces Edge. I wish Vicky Guerrero would fuck off. I don't even care who Edge's partner is. This show sucks Sonny Siaki's ass. There's a long mystery build up. And, and, and it's Ted DiBiase Jr. 
The audience are in silence. They tried hard to push this kid into the main events, but it just never worked. He's a charisma black hole. Now look, I get that DBRC is Orton's former legacy teammate, but I just don't care, he's not main event worthy. Edge is being sneaky here and he takes Orton out from behind. The most entertaining thing is the sign at ringside telling us that Sheamus is Ginger. I'm sure this sign changed his whole life. DBRC gets a two on a knockdown and puts the submission on. Orton smacks him in the gut to get him off and he hits some clotheslines. Edge is also smashed away. Snap slam on DBRC and suddenly Orton's in full control. Now it's the cross backbreaker from Orton. He starts gritting his teeth and going nuts and dumping turd in his nappy. The RKO is countered but Orton does manage to throw DBRC out the ring. The truth sort of runs down the ramp so DBRC gets back in the ring. RKO is over. I don't even know what to say. Why do people watch this over TNA? At least TNA was funny. There's literally nothing to like about Raw in 2010. It's a lifeless show filled with a bunch of never will be wrestlers. Orton stalks Vicky Guerrero. Why doesn't she just, you know, run away? She screams at Edge, but he somehow knocks out. What even happened to him? He's been down for a full five minutes. Orton really wants to smack Vicky Guerrero. She starts hysterically screaming. She yells, I resign. Orton turns around and RKO's Edge. Vicky dumps blood in her nappy and runs away. Very appropriate because this show was dumb. How did TNA lose this Raw? WWE is literally on autopilot at this point. A six year old could write a more entertaining show. Let's catch the final part of TNA. We have 25 minutes left of the show, but the main event seems to be starting now. It's the nature boy AJ Styles. What the hell, Jeff Hardy doesn't even get an entrance. This is the most rushed show of all time. I've seen about two entrances during this entire show. They do have time for Rob Van Dam to cut a promo in a dimly lit corridor first. He says he'll win tonight. The crowd love RVD's entrance music. It just gives me flashbacks to the last time I played the TNA drinking game. Bob Van Dam, the whole effing show. Bob Van Dam. God, look at all those women that he's got after him. Look at all of them. Ring rats. Not looking forward to that video later this month. At least this match should be good. We've got plenty of the show left. Rob and Jeff are friends and they agree to work together against Styles. Rob boots his face off. They're having a good time in there. AJ Styles is double teamed and slammed time and time again. Jeff makes a pin which RVD breaks up and this causes them to start fighting. Hardy kicks Rob out the ring and gets a two count on Styles. Rob storms the ring with kicks for both guys. He also hits two suplexes with a float over on Styles. The pin's broken up. Jeff Hardy hits a couple of front suplexes and randomly a stunner on RVD. He does a net break to Styles, which Styles no sells. He's up within two seconds. Nice dragon screw from Styles on RVD. We haven't seen much from the Nature Boy in this match so far. RVD misses his float over in the corner and there's the Styles chop block. AJ puts on the figure four leg lock because he is the Nature Boy. It's a dumb move and Hardy leg drops him. Jeff's looking for his finishing maneuver but Styles is up quickly to stop him. He turns around into a big time monkey flip from RVD. Mr. Anderson is here attacking Jeff on the outside. These two meet on pay-per-view. Whilst that's going on, RVD tries a diving kick, but he hits the ref instead. RVD notices Anderson and rushes to protect his little friend. Whilst all three are fighting, Styles dives down on top of them. He isn't done and he DDTs RVD on the floor. He rolls him into the ring and pins Rob with his feet on the ropes, and that is the three. Rob has officially done the job. But there's still 10 minutes left of the show, and I'm not sure why. Jeff Hardy has a mic and he wants to fight Anderson right now. Anderson won't do it and instead he throws up a cobra? The Hulkster blocks him from leaving. Anderson tries to smack Hogan but Hogan's too strong. Hardy and Anderson will now fight but I don't think this is an official match. Hardy puts Anderson on a table and he dives off the commentary desk to hit the Swanton Bomb. Makes a change on this channel getting to see the right man hitting the right manoeuvre. We cut away from that to some grainy video footage. It's subtitles again. It's Desmond, Wolf, and Chelsea. They're plotting against Abyss in a toilet. They reveal that the whole attack was staged. And guess who's filming it? It's Lacey Von Botch, who needed a piss earlier. I never thought that these two storylines would connect. That ends the show. The rest of the show is just hype for the pay-per-view. Well, what do we think? I've said it a thousand times. No matter how bad TNA is, it's never boring. They're just so bad at timing things. Why did they try and fit nine matches into one episode? I've never seen so many wrestlers get their entrance cut in a show before. The show was actually okay if you remove that Orlando Jordan Rob Terry stuff. And they didn't even feature all their main guys. The Pope, Anderson, Sting and some Memphis mid-card. They didn't really feature any of them. What a stacked roster this was in 2010. Now in terms of ratings, Raw gained 0.1 from the previous episode. And TNA? They also gained. They went from 0.8 to 0.93. Which translates to around 1.28 million viewers for TNA. 
So this was used as justification that ending the Monday Night War was a good thing for TNA. As the weeks went by, their ratings would slowly increase back above the 1.0 rating, which is what they had been before the war. Let me know in the comments who do you think put on the better show this week and why. Also I'd like to hear if you think this series should be continued. I just thought it'd be cool to see how both companies reacted to the war ending, and if you don't agree with that I'll break you so bad you need mending.